I'm going to share with you some stories from the Bible about four people, okay? Now, your job is to find out what these four things have in common. Now, if you're, you're really, uh, I'll use a southern term, if you're really swoof, anybody heard that term before? That means very smart. If you're smart uh, and you figure it out early, I want you just to write it down. And it's kind of like a mystery. When we get to the end, you're going to see if you get it right. But four stories. And when I say stories from the Bible, I'm not talking about fairy tales. I'm talking about events, actual events that happen to people. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into one of those stories right now. Genesis chapter 16. Now, you know Abraham and Sarah, right? Abraham was the father of many nations. He received a promise that he was going to receive a child and was going to, again, be the father of of many nations, but he was struggling with this, and Sarah was as well. Why? Who can tell me why? They were very old. They were past the years where they could, you know, actually have children together. And so, like sometimes we do, Sarah had this idea, maybe God needs our help, right? Have we ever tried that before? And so Sarah had this this bright idea, you know, I have this servant, and maybe I can have a child through this servant, and enters Hagar. So once Hagar finds out that she's pregnant, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 16 and verse 6 that Sarai, and this is before she was renamed Sarah, Sarai mistreated Hagar. Okay, so Hagar, she did push the envelope a little bit. She began to act differently once she knew she was pregnant. So maybe she did some things that were not exactly right. But Sarah still mistreated her to the point that she actually fled. And verse 7 tells us that the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. Now when these are grouped together, the angel of the Lord, when it's the angel of the Lord, often some of our scholars believe that that's actually the Lord himself appearing as an angel. So the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. Now, if she's out in the desert, is that a good situation? No. She's struggling. She doesn't know what to do. All she knows is she's got to get out of there. So she's out in the desert by herself. And here's what the angel of the Lord says. Hagar, slave of Sarai. Where have you come from and where are you going? Where are you going in your life right now? You've left with what's happening. Now, God already knew the answer to that, but yet he's trying to get her to talk. And so Hagar answers, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. So I've got something I want you to do. I want you to go back and submit to Sarai. Verse 10, then the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. So here she is. She's abandoning everything. She's in the desert. She doesn't know what she's going to do with her life. And here the Lord appears to her, said, I have heard of your misery. I I know what you are facing right now. Verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. Can you say that title with me? The God who sees me. One more time for fun. The God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. She was in the most desperate place. She didn't know what she was going to do with her life. And then God said, I've heard you. And she said, you are the God who sees me. I want you to bank that in your mind. That's your first story. We're going to try to find out what all four of these stories have in common. Okay, next we are going to Jesus. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. And it tells us of a, a party that's happening right now. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. 
So we've talked about this before. This woman was known for her sinful life. That means when she walked in this door, everybody knew her life story. Now, can you imagine being that woman walking through the door? What are you feeling in that moment? Scorn, shame, unworthy. So this woman in that town who lived in a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So kind of backstory, she's probably thinking, you know, I've heard about this Jesus. He's healed people. He's done amazing things. You know, he must be a messenger, somebody from God. And she's examining her life and, you know, I've done this and I've done that, but is there hope for me? So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his feet weeping can you just put yourself there for a minute you're bearing the shame you feel like all eyes are on you you feel like there's no hope for your life but you've heard about this jesus and the second you come to him you are overwhelmed by your sin overwhelmed by hope is there any chance for me and she goes down to her knees And she begins weeping at the feet of Jesus and wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now, he might have thought that in his mind. Maybe he didn't say it, but everyone else probably in that room was thinking the same thing. She is a sinner. It's almost like she bore that labor, label on herself. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? Now, obviously... Simon saw her, right? What was Jesus getting at? Do you see beyond the label sinner? Do you see her in this moment? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And the story goes on to to say that Jesus said to her, your sins are are forgiven i want you to bank that that's the second story you get you getting any clues as to what the common thread is if you think you know go ahead and write it's kind of like a mystery as you write it you might change your theory a little bit later but there's your first two stories and as we look at these i want you to put yourself in the story put yourself in the story of hagar put yourself in the story of this sinful woman And I want you to see how God responded. Let's look at the next story, and this might blow your theory. Judges chapter 6 and verse 1. Now, during this time, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So they were sinning, they were doing wrong things. And for seven years, God gave them into the hands of the Midianites, okay? So they sinned, and now they were reaping the punishment of their sin, the consequences of their sin. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Okay, so when you hear those words, oppressive, what's coming to your mind? The Midianites are coming in, they're stealing They're beating them. They're they're doing whatever they can to make their life miserable. So much so that the people of Israel are hiding in caves, shelter. They are not the strong nation at this moment. They are weak and they are hiding. And into this time, if we skip to verse 11, we see that the angel of the Lord came. Here it is again. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, not Oprah, in Ophrah, where Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, usually, usually what do you do in a wine press? You crush the grapes, right? Why was he here? He was in hiding. He didn't want to do this out in the open. 
And so he is in hiding because he's been oppressed like every other Israelite. He's there in hiding to keep it from the Midianites. Verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to this person who's hiding, Gideon, he said to him, the Lord is with you, what? Say it, mighty warrior. Can you say that with power? Mighty warrior. And what is Gideon thinking? Who, me? (laughs) Are you looking at me? (laughs) Surely no. Gideon didn't think that of himself. Later when he was asked to, to lead and deliver the people of Israel, here's what he says. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest, a bunch of weaklings, <laughs> in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. You, you chose the wrong guy. We're the weakest clan, and I'm the weakest in my family. I'm the least. The Lord answered, I will be with you. You will strike down all the Midianites. Okay, that is story number three. I want you to write down what did those three stories have in common. Are you getting a picture? Maybe the last one will change your theory. Okay, let's go. Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. There were people that were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. Don't bother Jesus. He's busy with the grown-ups. He's he's talking to them. Don't, Don't weary him. Don't bother him with these little children. Let's see how Jesus responds. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. What does that word indignant mean? Come on, say it. He was upset. He was mad. How how dare you, disciples? How dare you do that? He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. What were you thinking, Peter? What were you thinking, John? These little children, the kingdom of God belongs to them. Story number four. Okay, let's just for fun. I want to hear, what are your your theories? What do the four of these stories have in common? Kelly. God sees. God sees differently than we do. That's true. Anybody else? Yes. Okay, he's using the least likely people. But you're, you're getting very, very warm. Anybody else? Okay, he's, that is true. He is your strength in the weakest time. One more here. We all need Jesus. That's very true. So we're going we're gonna to give the prize that we don't have to, to Shannon. Here's your partial prize. There you go. What do all of these have in common These are ones considered of low value that God considered of great worth, right? Go back to the story. Hagar, a lowly servant, seemingly forgotten in the desert. And who is God to her? I am the God who sees you. I heard you. You're not silent to me. I I heard you. I see you. Think about this sinful woman that everyone had written off. There's no hope for her life anymore. She was branded this sinful woman. And what did God do? What did Jesus do? Do you see this woman? He lifted her up and said, hey, Simon, you need to take note here. See this woman? Remember the story of Gideon? He was living in fear. But yet, and he felt like he was the the least and the weakest of his family even. But yet God raised him up and called him a mighty warrior. And then these little children that in that time were put down, that were not considered that valuable. He said sternly to his disciples that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He took the weak and the lowly 
and he raised them up. Why? Because he saw a great value, great worth in them. You know what kind of got me thinking in this direction this week? I've heard some sad stories of people who feel worthless and specifically are ravaged by the exposing of their sin. Just because we have kind of a, a, a mixed crowd here today, I won't go into the whole story, but there's a story of a lady who, because of some of the sinful things that she did, basically they were advertised for all the world to see. And she didn't want them to, see, to be seen anymore. Three years she struggled with it. Everywhere she would go, people would ridicule her and shame her. She even went to court to stop all of this from happening. One in court, but it had to, to pay a lot of money. And so really, she kind of lost anyway. There's no way to stop all of this happening. So after three years, she ends up taking her life. Because the shame was too great for her to bear. She felt like there was no hope whatsoever for her. And I, and I think, you know, maybe there's some of you here that feel like your sin is too great. And you sometimes you struggle with this, am I worth anything? You know, I've blown it. I've done this. I've done that. Is there any worth to my life? And you know what would break my heart? is for someone like that to come into this place and to walk out the same way feeling worthless. Because Jesus would not put up with that. Would he? No. I've heard sad stories of people who feel worthless, ravaged by the exposing of their failures. Uh, I, don't, I, I wish I could remember the name, but uh, from my hometown... Uh, Atlanta, the Atlanta Braves. Uh, they were in the World Series at one point, and I can't remember the pitcher, but it was the final game. And this one picture, pitcher that had done so many great things, he blew the game, and after that, he never pitched again. He was booed, uh, and his life, he struggled from that point on. Why? For one failure, and that failure defined his whole life, and he felt worthless now any uh, famous baseball stars here no does it apply to you yeah maybe some of you you've you've lost your job before or you've you've been divorced or you've had something happen in your life and you you feel like a failure you know i, I struggled in this area you know i didn't graduate or this didn't happen in my life and you feel like a failure and you struggle with is there any worth for my life? And you, you feel this pressure coming in all around you. I wanna, want you to know that God sees worth in you. I hear sad stories of people who feel worthless, ravaged by the exposing of their inabilities. You know, we have some people that maybe are handicapped and they can't, they can't do this or they can't do that or some people struggle in different areas, and they just can't do what everybody else can. And they, I think high school is a difficult situation, but those people that can't do certain things, sometimes people just pick on them, right? They're the, the weakest link, and they just make them feel worthless, like there's no value whatsoever to them. And they struggle with that, and they, they wonder, is there any worth for my life? And then I've heard sad stories of people who feel worse, worthless, ravaged by the exposing of their social standing. And again, I think about uh, high school, those kind of things. You know, you're not part of the in crowd, you're not popular, or even church. You know, you may come into church and you see everyone else talking with people, and you come in and nobody talks to you whatsoever. You feel like you're there, but nobody cares. Lastly, with this, I've heard sad stories of people who feel worthless, ravaged by the exposing of their lack. You know, maybe you don't have as much money as the, the next person, and you're struggling in your life, and you feel like, you know, you're never going to make it above this level. And because of that, just because of society and the pressures, if you begin to feel worthless inside, and that breaks my heart heard sad stories of people who don't feel loved because of this. They don't feel appreciated 
They, they feel like life has passed them by. And these situations can lead them to doubt their worth. Uh, they can kind of feel like, have you ever dropped change on the floor and you see a penny? And you're like, let's just leave it. Right? Sometimes people feel that way. They feel like that penny that's left on the floor that it's not even worth bothering picking up. And some people feel that way in their life. When they doubt their worth, they begin to try to give up on life. They say, why bother? It wouldn't matter anyway. So what I want to say to you in light of all these things is that God sees you just like he saw Hagar. That God sees your potential just like he saw that potential in Gideon and called him a mighty warrior. God sees your value just like the little children that were there. And the sinful woman, God saw the value in each and every one of them. And God sees the value of you. Now, when we talk about value, I, I kind of ask the question, how is value determined? Uh, I have a couple ideas. You know, sometimes it depends on the appraiser. How many of you have had your house appraised before? Isn't it amazing? Sometimes you can do all of this work on your house, and especially these past years, your house can actually go down in value. And you're like, what? My house is better. How is it valued here? Have you ever wondered that? And sometimes it depends on the appraiser, the person looking at your house. Maybe what they see, maybe what they don't see. How is value determined? Sometimes it depends on who has used it. Okay, let's say, Nicole, look at that watch right there. How much do you think, how much would you be willing to pay for that watch? A quarter? It is very stylish. It, it comes with the free man hair right there. <laughs> would you like to know how much that is worth? That works, uh, watch is worth $24,000. And you know why? Because Elvis Presley wore that thing. Okay, let's have some more fun. Are you ready? How much would you be willing to pay for a beret, Deborah? Nothing. I'm not going to wear that thing. Do you, do you recognize that? No, I never saw that one. <laughs> okay. Would you like to see how much that beret is worth? Let's go. Oh, wait. First, I, just for fun's sake, does anybody recognize that beret? It was worn by somebody famous. I don't know that. <laughs> you win. It, John Wayne actually w wore this. And this beret is worth $179,250. Okay. One last one. A dress. Normally, this is probably worth, maybe at the time that it was made, less than like two or three bucks, maybe $10 at the time that it was made. I don't know. But now, you know who it is, right? Who is it? Dorothy. Dorothy that's right. It was just guess. How much? 100 grand? 200 grand? I feel like we're auctioned here. <laughs> and let's see what happened at an auction. 22.8 million. And let's just, let's just look at it. It's just material. It's just a dress. What makes the difference? Simply, who used it, right? Let's look at another thing that determines value. It depends on whose image is on it, right? I mean, if we were to really look at it, a baseball card is just a piece of paper that's printed on worth maybe a dime or maybe more with cardboard, you know. But yet, when it has a picture of a famous baseball player and it's rare, then it becomes up in value. And I wish I had a value for this, but I don't, sorry. But you know what I mean. Uh, some of those baseball cards can go for a very high value. But ultimately, what is value based on? Ultimately, it depends on how much someone will pay for it. Isn't it? Isn't that true? The value is, that's why your house goes up and down, because it's based on how much people 
are willing to pay for it in that moment. So let's go and let's look at this spiritually. How is value determined? It depends on the appraiser. You know, you can have some bad appraisers in your life, and that's the problem that we've been talking about. Somebody, some people appraise their life by what people at school think of them, what people at their job think, and even what people at church think about them. Is that your best appraiser? Who's your best appraiser? God. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? So half a penny each. (laughs) Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. That means he cares even about them. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Maddie, how many do you have right there? You don't know? God does. Isn't that cool? He cares about you that much that he even knows how many hairs are on your head. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than sparrows. You are worth more. What was the other thing? Uh, Well, here's a point to remember. If God sees value in you, then there is value. Some of you are fighting this inner narrative in your mind. I'm not worth anything. And you love to quote it to yourself. I'm no good. I'm this. I'm that. And this narrative is going on and on and on. But you need to see what God says. If God says there's value in you, then there is value. Amen? Other thing that determines value depends on you who used it. So we have value because he is using us and making us into something of value. Amen? Ephesians 2.10 For we are God's what? Masterpiece. Do you know that, Deborah? You're not just one of those works. You're actually a masterpiece that God created. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. He plans to use you. He plans to use each and every one of us. And that brings value to our life. What was the other thing? How is value determined? It depends on whose image is on it. Can you say amen to this? Let's look. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Who do you think it's talking about? Jesus. And even right now, what are we called? We're called Christians, which is Christ-like. We bear his image to a world that's in need. And that gives us great value. So your value is not based on what you do, but on whose you are. Let me say that again. I want you to begin to let that sink down. Your value is not based on what you do, but on whose you are. Now, I want to stop because I don't want you to get the wrong message. Uh, This message is not a love yourself message. Everybody, grab your arm, put it here and here. Hug yourself. Thank you. That is, that's not the message that I'm giving you today. Some people overestimate their value apart from Christ. They think that they're everything and that life is all about them and everybody should serve them and everybody should treat them this way or that way. That's not what I'm talking about. Matter of fact, Romans 12, 3 says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. So if you think life is all about you and people serving you, and treating you the way that you deserve, then I'm not talking to you today. I'm talking to the people that feel like they have no value. This message is for those who feel like they have no value or worth. Your value is not based on your achievements. It's not based on your social standing. It's not based on your physical attributes, no matter how pretty you are. It's not based on your mental abilities. Your value is based on the fact that God made you. Amen? That there is potential that God sees in you, just like he saw in Gideon. And your value, most importantly, is based on what God was willing to pay for you. Remember that? Your value depends ultimately on how much someone will pay for you. Think about what Jesus did for you on the cross. 1 Peter 1.18 tells us, It was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. That means bought back 
from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Melanie, would you mind coming? And would you stand with me right now? I neglected to do something this morning uh, before I spoke to you. A side note, but I love you guys. I want you to know that. I care about you, and I hope you can know and feel that. And my heart goes out because, you know, I wonder if sometimes that there's been people that have walked through these doors, maybe that we have judged, that I have judged, and have walked out feeling like nothing. And again, that breaks my heart. I don't want to be the one that, that God chastise and says don't you know that the kingdom of god is such as these you know but if you're here today and you feel god speaking to you you're struggling with this whole issue of work maybe because of sin maybe because of failure in your life maybe because you're not as good as everybody else you feel that way or you feel like you're poor and you're struggling with finances for some reason today when you walk into this place, you feel less than. Would you just bow your heads, close your eyes with me for a moment? If that's you, you feel less than. I want you to remember who God is. He is the God that sees you. He has heard you. Just like that sinful woman, he lifts you up and he sees you. Just like his little children, he says, kingdom of God is such as these. Just like he spoke to Gideon, mighty warrior, he sees value in you. So if he sees value in you, where are you getting these messages from? You're getting those messages from the enemy of your soul, Satan. He wants you to feel worthless. Why? Because he wants you to give up. But I tell you today, don't give up. You've got a God that loves you so much that he was willing to pay the highest price for you. What was that price? His life. He gave up his life for Bridges. He gave up his life for Joel McPherson. He gave up his life for each and every one of us here. So I want you to actually picture that in your mind right now, especially those of you today that feel worthless. I want you to picture what Jesus did and realize that he did it for you. I want you to see him looking in your eyes right now. You are of great worth to me. I love you. I want you to picture him picking you up right now from that, that place that you're in and lifting you up and causing you to stand. I tell you today, there is great worth in you. God loves you so much. If God's speaking to you today, you know, I struggle on this one. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I also think about that, that sinful woman. What did she do? She didn't care what other people thought. She just knew, she knew that she needed Jesus. So if you're here today and God is speaking to you so clearly, maybe your, your heart is even beating faster because you know that God is speaking to you today. If that's you, would you just come to the Lord today? Would you come down to this altar and say, God, I receive your love for me. Lord, help me to know my value in these altars are open right now. And if you see somebody come up here, I want you to, to come behind them and pray with them.